the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with Emmy-nominated actress Lee Purcell. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got Lee Purcell joining us again. Lee is a two-time Emmy-nominated actress whose roles stretch across the decades and involve some of the biggest and brightest names in show business over the past 40 years. From her breakout role on Adam at 6 a.m. to the cult classic Big Wednesday to her Emmy-nominated roles in Long Road Home and Secret Sins of the Father, she has graced us with some of the with some fantastic performances while acting along Side the likes of Michael Douglas, Orson Welles, Nicolas Cage, Dennis Hopper, Chadwick Boseman, and so many more. Back with us again tonight is the wonderful Lee Purcell, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Did he just kind of feel larger than life to you like he does to the rest of us? Well, you know, Orson was larger than life. He was a huge man. <laughs> Physically, he was really larger than life. But he was, um, yes, it was... It was surreal. You know, I had come from Steve McQueen, Orson Welles. So I guess I guess what that did for me in life all these years later, I, there's nobody who can intimidate me. <laughs> it just isn't. Steve McQueen, Orson Welles. That's how your life starts. You're set, you know? So because it, it, it was a completely different experience from really the luxury of at 6 a.m. This was really like low budget. And that was, uh, uh, you know, vastly different. And and Orson, because he was Orson, was treated like a king. And the rest of us, even though there was a tremendous cast and everybody had great careers later, um, everybody else, we were treated like, you know, kind of like second-class citizens. And so... Orson had, uh, we were all in these honey wagons and it wasn't a nice one. And, you know, I had just come off of a, uh, a, a, a tour of the entire country, staying in the, fi- in, in the finest hotels and limos, the whole thing. Now I'm in um, a, a dressing room that we called the coffins because they were so small and uh, not nice. And, uh, but yeah, we were young. So, you know, you want to experience things. And, and I did. <laughs> And so, and we were up high on a hill, and I'm telling you this story to kind of tell you what Orson was like. And we could see down the hill in kind of a little valley, we could see Orson's 50-foot luxurious trailer and his chef's trailer, which was right next to it. And then at lunchtime, you know, we could see, we, we would all like be spying on Orson. And and the chef would come out with, just like in a movie, and with a bottle of, I'm just trying to show you, a bottle of wine and saying, how about this? Let, it, let him smell the cork. Let him do it all. All the whole thing. And we and we were like watching this from, you know, high above. And he had the crystal and the china and the silver. And, and, um, and he would choose the wine. And then we could smell his lunch cooking. It smelled like delicious. And... Uh, and, and and the chef would bring out his his meals on a, you know, covered by a silver cover and lift it up. Mr. Wells. And meanwhile, a truck would come up, a pickup truck, and like throw our lunches at us <laughs> in brown paper bags. And it, and it would be something like, you know, a soggy tuna fish sandwich, a can of Coca-Cola, and maybe a, you know, maybe a, a little bit too soft apple and that would be ours and and i just come off of you know luxury and now i was doing this but it was it was actually good for my for my ego you know and um and so orson you know you would think with all that that he would have been obnoxious and he wasn't and particularly with me because all of his dialogue mostly was with me and mine with him we had a few scenes with other people, but but he was um, he was great, and he had that voice, you know, the Orson Welles voice. It was just mesmerizing, just mesmerizing in person, mesmerizing on film. And he was a very big man, and there are pictures of us on the internet 
um, I'm in this kind of floating hippie kind of costume and he's in his warlock costume. And, um, and uh, those are you know kind of great treasures because there's not a lot of people around who work with Orson. And, and so I'm going to jump way ahead here. Years and years and years and years and years later, I'm doing, I'm producing the show that I produce now, Hollywood Radio Players. And, and we were looking at, well, what, you know, because we do, we perform, we reenact classic radio plays because I love classic radio, classic dramas and comedies and musicals. And I just love them all from the 1920s, the 1940s and, and even beyond a bit. And so um, I decided that I was going to direct uh, War of the Worlds as an homage to Orson, the Orson I had known, and an homage to War of the Worlds, which I loved and had heard 150 times. And um, because my grandmother had a vinyl record of it. And and so I did. I, I directed that. And my producing partner, Michael Carnegie, who is a incredible, um, just many voices, an incredible actor, and a great producer and a great editor. And um, so I cast him as Orson because I looked at all the people we had available to us. Um, and and he was, to me, he was Orson. And, and he did him so beautifully when you see the show. If you see the show, I hope you will. Um, you will see how beautifully Michael does Orson. He plays another character too, but man, does he do Orson well. Uh, Orson Welles well. And uh and so that, so I jumped many decades, you know, ahead just because I wanted to tell you that. And in the, in the show, I, you know, we have a wonderful, um, we have had two wonderful hosts. Uh, our first host was Tom Bergeron and he did uh, seven, you know, Tom Bergeron, Emmy winner, Dancing with Stars, so forth. Mm -hmm. And he did uh, our first seven shows. We've just uh, done 10, number 10, and that comes out tomorrow, actually. And um, and then and then uh, Tom had to go off into a movie. Poor guy with William Shatner, lucky guy. And so uh, Lisa Gibbons is our new host, and she has just done her second show with us. And but when I introduced, I, because Tom did the hosting of War of the Worlds, and then I did an intro just because it was so uh, personal to me. And then I know a lot about the history of War of the Worlds and. And, then, and what, what really happened in 1938, as opposed to the mythology of what happened. And uh, so I, I talk about that. And and then the, and then we do the play and uh, the radio play of, that Mercury Theater did 1938 that um, Orson, Orson did. And um, Orson, you know, people, a lot of people think that 1938 were the worlds of when he first uh, became well known. It's not true. He was, and he was 27 years old, I think 27, when he did War of the Worlds. But he was already a top Broadway producer. He had three hit Broadway plays running it simultaneously. So I wanted, I really wanted to do that for Orson. It was like my, my homage, my gift to Orson. And you can see it. Go to HollywoodRadioPlayers.com. I actually have some questions uh, about that a little bit later on. And sure. I, what I one of the one of the next things I kind of wanted to chat about was um, Mr. Majestic. Um, sure. As as I recall, you were doing a play that wasn't maybe the best fit for you, and in kind of an unorthodox manner, kind of like your story earlier about going into the agent's office. It, 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 did you just go straight into? Walter Mirish's office and just kind of bypass your agent to 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 do how did that happen I I understand there's a story there so I was cast in Mr. Majestic um but I was also cast in this play simultaneously and and I figured I could I could not do both because Mr. Majestic was shooting on location in Colorado and the play was uh, here. And I thought it was a very important play at a very important theater. And so I, much to my agent's total horror, chose to do the play. And then, and so I turned down Mr. Majestic. And uh, because it, because um, my career had taken off and I was being offered a lot of stuff. And uh, I turned down Mr. Majestic and said, I'm so sorry. 
I really want to do a play, and there's this play, and I'm so sorry, Mr. You know, Mr. Mears, I'm so sorry. And then I started rehearsal for the play, and it was really quick. I realized, oh my goodness, this is a mistake. So I called up Mr. Mears. I always called him Mr. Mears. I, I sometimes called him Walter, but I didn't feel comfortable with that. He's Walter Mears, my gosh. He'd done everything. And uh, and so I called him up, you know, called his office, got him on the phone. And uh, and I, I said, first, let me apologize, you know, uh, for not doing film. He said, no, honey, I understand. You wanted to do a play, you know, totally understand that. And I said, well, don't want to do the play. I've changed my mind. I've been in rehearsals and mm, this is not going to be a good thing for me. And I want to do Mr. Majestic. And he said, well, you know, I have these actresses in the office right now in the waiting room. They're auditioning. And I said, oh, no, gosh, I didn't want to you know, hurt anybody or anything. He said, but I really want you to do the movie. I always did. And he said, um, just come on over to the office and um, I'm going to send everybody home. And I said, oh, no, no, that's really terrible. He said, no, it's kinder. It's kinder that way. Rather than letting them audition and then telling them they don't have it because you already have it. You know, you've always had it. And just come over to the office. We'll talk about it. So I did. went over to the office. All the other actresses had gone home. I felt real bad about, and um, and uh, we talked about it, and just talked about I don't know concepts and you know how I would do this and how I would play that, and and so and I did, you know, I ended up doing Mr. Majestic and not the play, which was a huge flop. So it was one of the, the good decisions I made. It was one of them. Another name that sticks out to me is your work on Big Wednesday with director John Milius, whom everyone from George Lucas to Steven Spielberg is pretty much called a genius. How did that role come about and what memories stick out to you about working with John? Well, John is a very good friend of mine and um, and he's doing, you know, I'm going to see him soon. And he had a, a terrible stroke, you know, several years ago, which he has in his John Milius way um, fought his way through doing much better. And he is a genius. He is, I think, one of the greatest writers, one of the greatest storytellers ever, ever born. And you just look at his body of work, I'm like, you know, Big Wednesday, Conan, um, gee, you know, Apocalypse Now, you know, he, he wrote that with uh, Francis. He just, you know, all these, you know, famous lines, uh, they're his, and he wrote them, and he is the greatest storyteller I ever met. And he's a great guy. I get along very well with him. He, uh, how did that happen? Well, again, my career was going well. I was offered a lots of things, and I get a call one day saying, you know, you have a, a meeting, uh, go over and meet with John Milius. And I'm like, what? John Milius? Yeah, John Milius at Warner Brothers. He had an office there for years and years. I said, okay. And um, they said, oh, you know, he has, a <laughs> he has a request. You don't have to audition. You know, you don't have to do a reading or anything. Um, he wants you for this one role. And I ended up uh, playing a different role. But um, he's, he wants you to come in a bikini. I said, I'm not coming in a bikini. Sorry, I don't do that. And, uh, they, and my agent said, you know, he wants you for the role. He just wants to see you in a bikini. I'm like, I don't do that. You know, I'm a serious actress. I don't have to do that. And uh, they said, well, that's what he wants. And I thought about it and I thought, oh, God, it's John Milius. I read the script. It was brilliant. But then I realized reading the script, I didn't want to play the role I was being offered. I wanted to do the other role. And I wanted to change the name of the Did other Did the role. original role involve a bikini? All the roles did because it's Big Wednesday. It's yeah. surfing. Got it. You know? And um, so I I I thought, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll make this palatable to myself. I will grant him his wish. I understand why, even though I don't like it, but I will make it so that it I can deal with it, you know, as a woman. And so I I had uh <laughs> I I had seen that um 
oh God, I don't know how to put this. Um, anyway, I decided I would wear a trench coat over my bikini. And then I would go into John's office and say hello, and I would flash him. And I did that. I walked in. I had on a trench coat, a bikini underneath. I said, are you watching? And he was like, uh, yeah. I said, don't blink. This is only going to happen once in your life. And he was like, well, okay. And I went like this. I flashed him in my bikini. I closed up the trench coat. And I said, is that enough? And he said, yep. And I said, okay, let's talk about the part. I don't want to do the part. I want to do this other part. And he was like, oh, that's interesting. Tell me why. And I said, because I have played that other part, like a number of times. It's no challenge. I don't want to do it. There's lots of actresses who can do that part extremely well. And you should hire one of them, but not me. I'm not doing it. And he was like, yeah, I think you're right. And, and that's the part I ended up doing. So she was written as Karen. I said, please change her name to something else. And he changed it to Peggy, Peggy Gordon. And that's how I got the part. And we became great friends. And, and we've been great friends all these years. And that film has become a bit of a cult classic since its release. Um, what do you oh, yeah. think has, has given Big Wednesday such staying power with film lovers? You know, it's really interesting because we were all horribly disappointed. It was given a very inappropriate release. It The PR was wrong for that film. It was just wrong. In my opinion, and pretty much everybody else's opinion, it was not, it, it didn't suit the film. It was like, they're surfing this and surfing that. And the film is not a film about surfing any more than Field of Dreams is just about baseball. You know, it's not. It's about friendship and it's about love and it's about time passing and loss and joy and set against a background of surfing, of course, just like Field of Dreams is set against, uh, against a background of baseball. And, um, but the marketing was like surfing, you know, and they didn't, they didn't look at the beauty of the story. They didn't promote the beauty of the story. They didn't market it that way. I think what has happened to that film, because it did not do well, we were horribly disappointed because that film was, the script was brilliant. Everybody in it was brilliant. And uh, the directing was brilliant. It was just amazing. The camera work was so innovative. Uh, uh, it just, nobody had ever seen anything like that. And um, there's no CGI. You know, it's the real deal. And um, so what happened, I think, to that film, because we were all, you know, we, we, we all know each other very well. And um, Jan is gone now, but, you know, the other one, you know, we're still around. And we've had a lot of different anniversaries and reunions and, and so forth. And so we got invited to go down to um, not Laguna Beach, but one of the, one of the, beach town big film festivals they invited us to go down there and we said oh, i will do that you know and and so the four of us it was always the four of us went because patty who plays the other female lead lives on the east coast and unfortunately she is never available for anything i adore her and we are in contact a lot um so the four of us you know me and and uh jan and uh gary and um billy went down to uh, this famous film festival and come to me and and we're in a limo and we get closer and we're like uh, we see a lot of people and this is a film festival they have a lot of films playing not just ours and we're like wow look at all those people there must be a really good film playing there and and we're looking and it's like as we get closer it's like it, it was unbelievable there were lines around the block and, and then we're like, wow, what is that film that's playing there? And and then we get closer and then we get out of the, the limo and then we, you know, approach, you know, approach the building and people go crazy. That They just go crazy that we're there. And it was like, what, 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 what's this about? And then, you know, the people who were, you know, taking care of us, they met us and they said, you know, we've had to uh, shut down all the other films 
because we had so many people show up for Big Wednesday, we've expanded it into all the theaters. And we were stunned. We were like, wait, Big Wednesday? Because we didn't know that it had this kind of groundswell. And this, we didn't know. I mean, nobody had told us. And so they said, so what you're going to do is um, we're going to kind of stagger the films, uh, the, the screenings, and then you're going to go into one theater and do a QA, and a and then you're going to go to the next theater and do a Q&A, and the next theater and q and I think there were probably three. And so we did that, and, and we were all just flabbergasted, really, as my grandmother would have said. And we uh, walked on the aisle of the first theater, and people, it was like Rock, Rocky Horror Picture Show. People were yelling our lines at us and expecting us to catch the cue and say the line back. And it was like, sorry, it's been a number of years. I don't know those lines. And and they're screaming at us like we're rock stars. And, and we're, we're just astounded. We had no idea. We do the Q&A, and then same thing happened in the next year, and same thing in the next year. And then we realized that this movie, all these years later, was a hit. <laughs> we're like, how can this possibly be? And I think it, I think what happened was that enough people had seen this movie over the years that they had reached the underbelly of the movie, the true story of the movie, not just, oh, it's about surfing and girls in bikinis, but the story of love and loss and friendship. And because it covers 13 years, that movie. And and we and it was a really it was really a period piece when we shot it. It was uh, you know, before before our at the time we were shooting it, and it covered a thirteen thirteen year period, and um, and so then every place we've ever gone since then about the movie, this is the way it goes. It goes like that, and it's just astonishing, really, to all of us. But I think that's what happened because when people talk to me about Big Wins and they haven't seen it, I'm talking about people who weren't born when we made that movie. You know, I, I mean, it's astonishing. And they're, and they're like, that's my favorite movie. I'm like, what? You're 12. And they're like, yeah, I know. My dad made me watch it. And I've seen it 50 times. And I watch it every whatever. So people come up to me. I Really, honestly, I have about three movies like that. That, you know, I go to an airport. I go to another country. I go to a, a mall, you know. And somebody will come up and go, oh, my God. You're in Big Wednesday. Oh, my God. You're in Valley Girl. Oh, my God. You're in yeah. Almost Summer. You know, I have about three. About, yeah. And then others that I thought should be like that. Mm -hmm. And they're not, they're beloved, but they're not like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, th I think that's what happened because, okay, this is what I was going to say. Whenever people talk to me who haven't seen Big Wednesday um, and they're like, oh, you know, I heard you in this movie, this Big Wednesday and it's a surfing movie. I'm like, no, it's not a surfing movie. Yes, it's a static kind of, background of, of surfing just like Rudy is set against the background of football but yeah. that's not what Rudy is about it's about the, this other thing right and um, I say look I want you to see it but I want you to see it twice because the first time you see it you're going to be blown away blown away by you know the surfing and the girls and and uh, and then uh, unbelievable cinematography and you're not going to see the story see it twice and then you're going to see the story and every single time, anybody who does that, who actually does it, comes back to me and goes, you're right. You're totally right. First time, I saw all the surface stuff is beautiful. Second time, I saw the story and I cried. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks to actress Lee Purcell for joining us. Lee will be back again next week for the next part of our interview. So please tune back in. Stay safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.